We're looking this evening at the source of the river of love that's supposed to flow out of our lives. So that's, that's our theme tonight. And basically, why this lesson is so important is Christ calls for not just love. He says believers are to be having rivers of radical divine love. How do I um, define radical? Okay, let me show you what I mean. Fine print. You have your own Bibles if it's too fine. Matthew 5:38. Uh, this is right in the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm reading from the New King James. Look what Jesus says. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. Turn the other to him also when he slaps you on the cheek. Verse 40. If someone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, get a high-powered lawyer and blast him and get double. Right? Did you know we have been so... Um, irradiated by our culture. We're a litigious, how do you pronounce L-I-T-I-G? Is it litigious or lit... Yeah, there we go. Thank you, Dr. Schrock. I see that. Uh, we're such a litigious society that we, we at the drop of a hat think nothing. Did you know my father was dying in Sparrow Hospital in Lansing, Michigan, and I was holding his hand and someone was outside that I knew, and they were motioning to me, and I came out and they said, I really think you could get a good clergy, or clergy, a really good medical malpractice, you probably could get a clergy one too, but a medical malpractice suit. And I thought, he's still alive. And, and they said they, they were observing and they think the doctor had maybe done something wrong and, and they wanted to help me file a suit. And they were a Christian. And our doctor was a Christian. And my dad was headed to heaven. But we are so materialistic and so litigated and, and materially driven that people measure their life by their wealth, not by their godliness. And so Jesus said, if someone slaps you, turn the other cheek. If someone wants to sue you and take your, your outer coat, let them have, uh, or your inner coat, let them have, you know, they're going for the inside. The tunic was here, the cloak was over it. They're after this, say, you want them both? See, that's, do you see why the early church, they couldn't kill them fast enough? You understand that, that, that Tertullian said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The, the Romans were coming, and they were killing them, and people were getting saved faster than they could kill them. And the soldiers killing them says, these people don't, you know, damn and curse you. They love. And, and the soldiers were putting their swords down and saying, could you tell us what you have? I, I'm not that way. This is what they were doing. This is radical. Do you see? This is radical stuff that I'm talking about. Let them have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile... Now, you know, this is a Roman soldier, and there was the law of compulsion. Those guys wore these 80-pound packs, the Roman legionnaires, and they were going around with their big pack, and they could walk up and say, Chris, under Roman law, you got to carry it, buddy. One Roman mile marker. And they're all over the Holy Land. When we go on tours, we stop and show people, there is a mile marker, a Roman mile marker. There's one right in the city of Capernaum. And so those people would walk right to the next mile marker and they dropped the pack, you know, hoping his iPhone got crushed when they dropped it, you know, like that. Because they were only compelled to go how far? By Roman law, one mile. Look at this. When a soldier compels you to go one mile, drop his pack and hope his iPhone breaks, right? Right at the mile marker. What did Jesus say? Go this, you ever heard, go the second mile? This is it. That's radical. Give to him who asks you and from him who wants to borrow from you. Don't turn away. You have heard it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, this is radical. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Why? 
that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? See, what he's saying is you can, you can get rewards at work. You understand that? When, when you're supposed to have your break and they went longer, you go, hey, why don't you take the rest of my break? And don't say it, you know. Just, I mean, honestly, just say, you made me carry your pack, you're, you know, take, I'll go the second mile with you. Verse 47, if you greet your brethren, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do that? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now this 48th verse that ends out the chapter is saying what we're looking at tonight, that this kind of love is impossible. So what is the origin and source of biblical love? It's God flowing out of our lives. Now let's open to Romans 5 in, in your Bible, and uh, we'll be taking some notes, but it's much more beneficial for biblical discipleship and counseling if you note some of these things as a jogging of your memory in your Bible. I mean, in other words, uh, that becomes, in, in fact, uh, I have a collection of Bibles. I, I recopy my Bible. This Bible is duct taped. Do you all see my duct tape? That's what I do in the last year when I'm copying it over. And I regularly, I just, every time, every three years, they wear out and I copy it over, and anything that was really good from all the devotions and all the notes and everything I found, I put in the new one and then start through it again. But when I see those little notes, it jogs my memory. You'll be surprised if you write just enough in your Bible that when you come back, boom, it, what the, the thrilling discovery you made will be back. So what we're looking at tonight is uh, that the origin and source of biblical love is God flowing out of our lives. And in, in your notes, now you don't have to turn there, I printed it out for you. Page 214, this is the boxed uh, deal on 214. At the end of our class, you're going to have the choice of either doing this as our table time or this, which is the box that's on 215. And basically, I read this last week, but I'll remind you, every believer in Christ, so this, these are born-again people, is responsible to do his part in establishing and maintaining harmonious relationships. Your example is the Lord Jesus Christ, who while he was here on earth, demonstrated how biblical love is expressed toward others. Now, how did Jesus do it? Did people hate him? Yes. Did he correct the hypocritical, the charlatans, the false? Yes. But did he uh, take their verbal abuse and their spitting and their kicking and their punching? Yes. Did he correct them? Yes. If they were wrong, but he never, when he was reviled, he didn't revile again. When he was mistreated, he didn't melt him, which he could have done. Wouldn't that have been something? They come up and hit him and he melts him. Now he did it once. Do you remember when? He didn't melt him. He knocked down an army of 600. Remember that? At the Garden of Gethsemane, his disciples were sleeping. They were just waking up. Have you ever just woken up and you're kind of not sure where you are and what you're doing? And remember Peter is doing the old sword trick, you know, and cutting off ears. He wasn't going for the ear. He just was half asleep. But Jesus wanted to protect the disciples. He knew they wouldn't make it. If they'd have been in, in prison that night and at all tortured, they would, have, they would have done more than deny. They would have renounced. And he knew that. See, the Lord already knows how much we can take. Remember? There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but will with the temptation always have exit doors. See, our doors are open. Every time we're tempted, God opens an exit door. What was the exit door in the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus leaves the sleepy heads behind, walks out to the army of 600. It, the Greek word is cohort. 600. And, and he walks out, and he says, who are, you, 
who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, what did he say? I am. Not he, because that's in italics. He just said the ineffable personal name of God. In Hebrew, when Moses met God, God said, I am that I am. That's the first thing you learn in Biblical Hebrew. You have to learn that. Eya, Ashe, Eya. That's how you say, I am that I am in Hebrew. So that's what he said. And so Jesus said, Eya, I am. They all, they didn't just tumble. They were flattened. Can you imagine going to war like that? You don't need grenades. You don't need what the wacko guy at the naval yard, all of his guns. You just speak. In fact, Jesus has levels of speaking. In Revelation 19, what happens when he speaks? And it kills every one of them. More than thanks, Daly. Exactly. When he speaks, at that moment, it kills every, all the armies at Armageddon. There's no fire. I mean, no shots fired. He just talks. And it's worse in Revelation 20. That time when he speaks, they burn. See, the Lord could have done all that, but how did he demonstrate biblical love? He had all that power, but he let him spit all over him. Because that's what his power can do in us. So let's talk about it. Let's look in Romans 5 at what I call the seven byproducts. Uh, You know when they refine oil? Back when we lived in Tulsa, they had a lot of refineries there. Um, They... They have these cracking towers, and depends on where, where they uh, refine it, what comes out, everything from, from crude to jet fuel and beyond, depending on where they, they, what temperature and, and where they uh, um, do the distillate coming out. Well, the byproducts of crude oil are many. Well, there are seven named byproducts of justification. Now, you remember we, in the early lessons on your sheet that we used to have, we covered the, the, what salvation does, the, the elements of salvation. And one element is justification. But just justification, look what it says here. This is what, this is a key chapter in justification. So if you are ever wondering about justification, you go to Romans 5, and it starts out saying, therefore, now remember whenever you have in studying the Bible, therefore is a hearkening back. You look back at chapter 4, the faith of Abraham and all that, and therefore, because of faith justifying us, therefore, having been justified by faith, and look what starts happening we start seeing byproducts. We have peace with God, uh, through whom also we have access by faith. We have grace in which we stand. See, you, you can see this. And we rejoice in hope. And not only that, but we glory in tribulation. That's when people pick on us at work and home in our neighborhood. And, and we're the picked on kid. You know, the, there's all this bullying and all this stuff. And, and there is an element, yes, of self-protection. Yes. You know, and, and someone asked me about that. They said, well, what about the beating husband, the, the aggressive, or I guess there, there have been some beating wives, about one in a million. Drudge finds them all. They're always in the news whenever a woman beats up her husband. Uh, I've always wanted to see a picture of those two, you know, which, you know, but, no, I really wouldn't. But, um, but the Bible doesn't ever say to stay and get pulverized. It never says that. Did you know that? When Jesus commissioned in Matthew 10, the 70, and he sent them out. Before that, when he commissioned the 12, he said, if they persecute you in one city, stay and let them burn you at the stake, right? No. What does it say? Flee. Yeah. Flee to another and shake the dust off. But flee to another. Before you shake the dust, flee to another. Don't stay and get pulverized. So the Bible never says that you're supposed to stay in the home and let the husband beat you to a pulp. Flee. But that's the same, I mean, if the, in, in the Coptic church, the true Christians that are in Egypt, when that mob of, of, of torch-bearing Muslims is coming up the street, you're not supposed to stay in your house and just die burning there. What, what, does that, what good does that do? I mean, if they lock you in, praise the Lord. Burn to death, go to heaven. If they don't, the Lord says, flee to another so you can share the gospel another day. You understand that? There's no, 
The early church got mixed up. Did you know what they used to do? When they were feeding people the lion, people would walk up and say, I'm one too, throw me in. That was a problem in the early church. People wanted to be martyred because they made such a, you know, a great praise to the Lord when people died in the arena. And, and the apostles remembered the words of our Lord under inspiration, wrote this down, and the early church pastors were saying, when they persecute you, flee to another. Don't run in the arena and get eaten up. Go to another place and share the gospel. So, uh, but look at verse 5. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love, and, and here's what we're looking at. This is the radical love. Right here, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us is the kind of love... Let me get back here. Where to go? That makes us able to do this. That makes us able to not resist an evil person, to turn the other cheek, to let him have your cloak, to go the second mile, and to love your enemies. Where does that kind of love come from? Right here. Because it's a byproduct of justification. It's because the love of God has been poured out. So let's look at these one at a time. Uh, number one, the first byproduct is eternal peace. We have peace with God. Now there's three kinds of peace that is talked about. There's the peace of God, uh, there's the peace with God, and there's peace that the Lord gives us that comes from him uh, as we go through things. But we have a peace of God always with us. We have peace with him, which is this one, uh, that justification produces. And then when our heart is troubled, we can ask for and receive peace from him. Uh, that's kind of the Isaiah 26.3 type of peace. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. It's peace that God sends to us. But we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You say, what is that? the end of our warfare. We were at enmity with God. We were born enemies of God. Kind of like the, not the Clampets, the Hatfields and the McCoys. Do you remember the, the warring Kentucky families? That's what we were like. But we have now eternal peace. Secondly, look at this, another byproduct, endless access, through whom we have access by faith. We can come, as it says in Hebrews 4, right before the throne of grace and mercy. We can boldly come. And we have access by faith. Endless access. Eternal peace. And look at this. Grace in which we stand. Th this grace to stand is kind of what Martin Luther, remember at the Diet of Worms, uh, when, when he went there and, and he gave his confession and he knew if he got excommunicated, they could burn him. He said, I just stand here. I'm standing. That is grace. See, God gives us the grace to stand. But it doesn't stop there. There are seven beautiful elements. We have rejoicing hope. That means when they are reviling us, when they are speaking evil of us, when they are making us go the mile, when they are suing our tunic off of us, we can rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have, we have possessions that are incorruptible, undefiled, and will never fade away, reserved in heaven for us. We have a hope that causes us to rejoice because of who we belong to. We have a new perspective on trouble. And not only that, but we glory in tribulations. This is an interesting word. It's the word thalipsis. Uh, THL isn't usually a diphthong we have in English language, but philipsis is the Greek word for tribulation. And what it means is it's being twisted. It's like, you know, if you just twist a piece of paper, it says when life twists us, when, when we are squashed and, and have those tribulations, we know that tribulation produces perseverance Perseverance refines our character. Now, now if you have a, a gold ring, gold doesn't often naturally occur beautiful. It's always, off, almost always, with other things. 
and they have to purify it with these horrible acid and all kinds of stuff and then of course they have to uh, refine it with fire and skim off all this dross that's what God says we're like yeah we're we're gonna come forth as gold but when we get solipsized, you know tribulations it, it makes perseverance, which is the Lord holding us up through the tribulation. And as we allow him to hold us, so we persevere, our character gets refined. And as our character is refined, we start having this rejoicing hope. It just, it just, this word, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. It's that Isaiah 40, 31 type of hope. It's a hope that um, actually the, the Isaiah 40, 31 Hebrew word is translated in the New Testament by the word, this word for hope. It's hupo mone. Hupo means under and mone means to bear up. And so that's what this is, this hope that bears us up. Here's the next one. The sixth byproduct is sure hope. Hope doesn't disappoint. God said, if you go through this product of, of tribulation, my persevering arms holding you up, your character getting refined, your hope uh, growing so that it's sure, it'll never be disappointed. That means when we come to the end of the line, the Lord says, in fact, I read it to someone this week. I had someone stop in this week. This is a very interesting week. I had many people stop in, but one of the stop-ins was someone that, that said, um, just want to let you know I have cancer, and so does my wife. And then he just burst into tears. So what do you do? I mean, okay, you're counseling. Someone comes to you, says, my cancer's going to my bones. My wife now has cancer. And they burst into tears. Where do you go? You're the counselor. What do you do? Cry with them? Good. That's what I do. But they, they, they want a little more than that. Okay, what do you do? So I took them, among other places, I'll just show you, to the next uh, book, or two books over, 2 Corinthians 4. And what I told them is, in 2 Corinthians 4, by the way, with cancer people, I always download for them on the spot Piper's article and you just go on Google and put Piper don't waste your cancer. Isn't that a great title? Don't waste your cancer. And, and as I was turning to 2 Corinthians 4, I hit the print button, you know, I went to Google and put don't waste your cancer Piper and I printed it off. But then I went here and I said, look at verse 17. Well, I'll start in 16. Therefore, we don't lose heart. I think this person was. Even though our outward man is perishing. The outward man is definitely perishing. Cancer is ravaging. Bones are, are becoming the recipients of the cancer. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. But most of us don't realize that. Most of us don't think about that. And most of us don't feel that. Because we base everything on feeling instead of on Faith. See, faith overcomes fear. See, it's faith in the promises of God over fear. Faith is greater than fear. It's we believe and overwhelm those fears by the grace of God. Because our inward man is renewed day by day. And then look at what Paul said. For our light momentary affliction is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. See, hope doesn't disappoint because the Lord says that this amount of suffering now grows to an incomprehensible amount of glory then. And so what people don't realize is it's almost like you can trade things in. It's like um, my grandparents used to do this thing where you'd collect these little tokens you know if you would help them in this, with their yard work and you could trade those tokens in for something much better in a real sense earthly struggles cancer job loss health deprivation work stress not self-induced but 
but when we don't when we don't deserve what we get. When we let this process of our perspective on troubles through justification work, our little blips of light momentary affliction works an eternal capacity. Look what it says. Worketh a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now that's a real interesting play on words. The word glory, kavoth, means heaviness. So it works a, a heaviness, a weight of heaviness. This is almost like double talk. What he's saying is, you have no concept of how much earthly suffering produces in heavenly currency. If so, you wouldn't avoid. Remember I told you last week or the week before about pain the gift nobody wants that Yancey and Brand wrote? What they said is, Americans are missing out on a lot of glory in heaven because we don't want any pain. We don't want any suffering. We avoid it at all costs. We stay five miles away from any trouble that, that we can avoid. And so, of course, there are places we wouldn't go and share the gospel because they would reject us. Yeah, but when they do, you get an exceeding weight of glory. But let's get, none of that was what we're on tonight. We're on number seven, so come on. You guys quit. You guys keep distracting me, okay? <laughs> Rivers of love. It says, because the love of God has been poured out. This is a beautiful word. You know what it means? I looked up the Greek word standing beneath this. Do you know what it means? Poured out. It really, it's just like what I see. I see in pictures. I see, do you ever live in a big city where the police or the firemen come around, all the kids couldn't wait, and they crank those hydrants and they just go like that. That's the Greek word, like a fire hydrant. God says you and I are to have fire hydrants that are, that are rivers from the Spirit of God that, that was given to us. And, and we should have that outflow, rivers of love. Okay, so God offers a river of love. Now do you know, when you think of rivers of love, what first comes to your mind? John 7. I knew that you would say that, so go to John 7. And if you haven't yet highlighted this, uh, or you can just write on your sheets, look this up later. But if you've got your little highlighter in your hand, look what Jesus says. And, and people are going to come to you struggling with all kinds of things in their life. Uh, there, there are those that, that are downcast. There are those that are discouraged. There are those that feel no one cares about them. There are those that whatever, you know, the others just feel so far away from the Lord. So one of the places you can go, and usually I go to several places because... It's almost like you don't know when people are listening when they aren't. And, and so you just keep sharing the scripture and all of a sudden you see them, it's almost like um, the lights come on to go. And it's just like the Lord is communicating through that verse. And it might be this one. It says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. I told you the story that last time. He who believes in me, that's all born again Christians, the scriptures have said out of his heart, flow these rivers. And, and how do the rivers flow? Verse 39, he spoke concerning the Spirit that those believing would receive. So when, when we have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit produces a river, and the river, one of the parts of the river is its love. And so God offers through his Spirit, because of salvation, a river of love. Okay? But how do we have even a capacity to have this river? Because of regeneration. Now, I'm not going to take you there, but do you remember this great verse? This is the, the expression of the new covenant. You've, you've all heard of the new covenant. In fact, the New Testament covenant is testament. It's just they translated it depending on what year, you know, when the King James came through, they translated that word covenant as testament, you know, kind of like uh, last will and testament. But it's actually the word covenant. And so there's the old covenant, the Old Testament, the new covenant, the New Testament. But Ezekiel is in the Old Testament. But in the Old Testament, God, in this verse, describes the new covenant. Because God made the new covenant with Israel. 
And at the, at the Lord's Supper, he included us in the church into it. I'm so glad. Uh, now, the New Covenant has a lot more than a new heart. It has a lot of, of real estate that he didn't give the church, which is the confusion. Uh, that's, and I'm not going to get into eschatology, but those that are covenantal theologians, uh, they have to do a funny dance because the New Covenant promises from the Mediterranean all the way to the Euphrates, all the way down to the river of Egypt. And that, those are geographic, kind of like, uh, you know, on a Google map, you know, all of the, the, the uh, longitude and latitude. It's, it's giving you an exact place on the map. And so the covenant theologians say, well, Mediterranean means, you know, uh, the British Christians, and this is, I don't know who, and this is, I don't know, but it's, it's talking about the church. But God gives quadrant, I mean, actual map locators, but he doesn't give them to us. He gives them to Israel. What he does give to us is, he said, this part of the new covenant you get. You get a new heart that has an endless capacity for love. You know, I'm a deer hunter, and I found out that my dad altered my gun. It holds seven slugs. It's not supposed to. I think, how many in Michigan? Three? Do we have any hunters here? Is it three? Yeah. So no wonder my dad was such a good hunter. And so we've had to put a plug in there because you're not supposed to go out with seven slugs in your shotgun. It's current hunting law. Did you know a lot of people have gotten a plug in their love capacity? And they, they don't have room for anybody that they don't agree with, that they don't like, that doesn't look like them, that doesn't talk like them. And they stay as, as far away from anybody because they have a plug in their capacity for love. God says, no, I want to give you a new heart with an endless capacity for this kind of love. Okay, we have to have table time in eight minutes. So that takes us to Galatians 5. Now turn your Bibles here. You might want to mark this if you haven't. It's another element for your ability and skill in, in counseling. Almost everybody's heard of the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, you notice fruit is singular. And there's a lot of theological discussion about that. Um, and I'll point it out to you in just a second. But it says in verse 16 of Galatians 5, I say then, walk in the Spirit. So what we have is, we have a choice. Either we're going to walk in the spirit or we're going to walk in the flesh. See, and, and as a counselor, as you're talking to the person, you're, you're listening for clues. And here are the clues. Verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These two are contrary to one another, so you don't do the things you wish. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now, here, right here, the next section of verses is a diagnostic tool to see whether the person is walking in the spirit or in the flesh. Now, verse 19, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, that's any sexual relations when you're married to someone with someone other than the one you're married to. Fornication is any sexual relations without being married, which is rampant nowadays. Uncleanness is talking about it and looking at it. Lewdness is doing it. And, and all that, you know, all the dirty old, you know, I, I had my iPhone stolen in Rome last year. Did I tell this? Probably I told it, but, and, and I had it open at the time, and I was transferring money. I was paying some of our translators. I was sitting at a table in the Palazzo something, and, and I left it open and dumbed me, and it got stolen. But the long and short of it is that, that we had to get on the phone and call all the bank wire transfers and everything, because we were paying translators in foreign countries and doing wiring of money for a ministry, and, and so we had to shut all that down. And so the byproduct of that is for one year they had to turn this, uh, you know, the guy on TV that shows his social security card and says, hi, I'm so-and-so and that's my number and it doesn't do you any good because if you have my service. So they bought that service. Uh, social security lock or something like that. Do you know what comes with that? Every week at our home in Lawton, 
we get a map from that company showing where the latest sex offender moved within three to five miles of our house. They send you a map, your house, and they put a big red thing. And they don't just tell you they moved there. They tell you their name, their age, their height, the color of their eyes, the color of their hair, and what degree they were convicted of and what they did. It's kind of gross. Did you know out in Sleepy Lawton's vineyards, our house is surrounded by first, second, and third degree sex offenders that are between 19 and 70. And they're, they are, look at this, lewdness, uncleanness. Look at verse 20. Idolatry, sorcery, which has to do with drugs, hatred, contentions, the people you can never, nothing satisfy them. They're going to be angry at you forever. Jealousies, the people that wish you didn't have what you have and they don't like you having it and they want it. Outbursts of wrath, the people that just explode. They kind of look like, you know, boiling tea kettles going to scald you at any moment. Selfish ambition, that's the person that will climb over you on the ladder and kick you down. Dissensions, the person that's always bringing something up to divide people. Heresies, that's an interesting word. Hiereo means to lift something high. There are people, you know what a heresy is? They take a truth and they elevate it far higher than God made it. Kind of like you're never supposed to cut your hair, and if you do, you're sinning. You know, there's, there's a whole segment of Christianity that believes that. Now, you know, where'd they get that? Well, they can find a verse. But a heresy is where they take a minor thing in the scripture and they, they put it on the steeple. And heretics, um, um, let's see, where did I leave off? Selfish dissensions, heresies, verse 21. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelry, and the like. So those are the fruits of the flesh. But if you look at that list, there are 17 fruits of the flesh and eight of them are what this week is about. Interpersonal conflicts. Anger, jealousy, wrath, dissensions. They can't ever be reconciled. And when you meet a believer, and you will, you might not meet one that's a drug addict or a lewd, but you'll meet an angry one, and you'll meet a jealous one, and you'll meet a, all of those. What you're seeing is the flesh, not the spirit, is being lived out. And then you know the fruit of the spirit. You can read it. And it really appears that the fruit of the spirit is love. And when you have love, it manifests itself in all those other words. See, it's singular. It's kind of like... Everyone has the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. And in this context, it will show up as joy. And in this context, is peace. And in this context, is that persevering long-suffering and gentleness and like that. But that love, and Jesus said this. He says, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. Okay? Counseling, discipling. Love Challenge Saints starts in chapter 6. You can read it yourself if you want. And it, what it says is, we're supposed to, um, verse 1, in a spirit of gentleness, be real careful lest we be tempted. So we're supposed to restore them, verse 1 says, and that restore is that word to, to um, mend. It actually is the word for mending nets. Uh, the word for restore, it, it's to set broken bones. But if you read verses 1 through 10, it tells how we counsel and disciple love challenge saints. What's a love challenge saint? They're, they're living fleshly. They're angry. They're jealous. They're spouting anger. Uh, okay, now, it's... See, I told you we'd stop one minute because we started one minute early. So here we go. Now look on your sheets. How do we unleash that love? Well, this is what we're going to do tonight for the next 15 minutes. We're going to read as much as we can of the boxes. And, and you're a good table if you don't even get off page 214, okay? Don't, it's, this is not a Speedy Gonzales race. But just around the table, you read it till you bump into a verse, 
and you sign someone to look that verse up. And then you keep reading a little longer, bump into a verse, and then the people read the verses and discuss around your table those truths. And what we're looking for is, how do we unleash this kind of love? What does the scripture say? And then reserve however much time your table needs for prayer. So there we go, 15 minutes, go.